Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello, and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club Humanities Forum program. My name is Carla Marinucci. I am senior writer for Politico's California Playbook and your moderator for today. As the club continues to host virtual events, they are grateful for continued support of members and donors. So we hope you will consider making a donation online or text donate to 415-329-4231. The club would also like to thank the Bernard Osher Foundation for supporting today's Good Lit event and George Hammond for helping to organize this program. And just a reminder, if you have a question for today's guest, we're gonna be taking those. Please submit those to the chat. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce my dear friend, my colleague, my competitor, Dan Moraine, author of Kamala's Way and American Life. I have. Huge respect for Dan. He has covered California policy and politics and justice related issues for more than four decades. One of the most veteran reporters out there. Dan, of course, worked at the LA Times for 27 years. He spent eight years at the Sacramento Bee where he was editorial page editor. And of course, at Cal Matters where he was a force of nature. Um, Dan wrote his first story, by the way, on Kamala Harris in 1994. And he covered both her campaigns for attorney general and for U.S. Senator. Uh, Dan, what a pleasure to be with you. <laughs> well, thank, thanks so much, Carla. It's just, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure. It's an honor to be uh, with the Commonwealth Club and, and, and always great to talk with you. Well, let's get into this because there's so much to talk about today. We're gonna be taking questions. Please hit us on the chat. You know, your book is called Kamala's Way. And I think the, the, the significant thing about this book is how you map out that if there's one thing we know about Kamala Harris for covering her for years, and I did that myself too, it's that she found a way time and again to handle challenges, to avoid the pitfalls, to thread the needle, to ultimately end up on top of the political heap. I mean, you know, the most powerful woman in the most powerful nation on earth. So I, I just want to talk about that first, a little bit about that history. The subtitle is An American Life. Um, She's the daughter of immigrants. And like so many of us, we have these immigrant roots. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on, you know, the daughter of an Indian mother and a Jamaican father. How did that shape who she was and how she was able um, to, to get past so many of the hurdles that she faced in her political career? Well, you're, you're right. Um, so, so much of um, Kamala's way, you know, it, it, it it's got a couple different meanings. One was the path, how she got from where she was in Oakland and Berkeley in 1964, born uh, to uh, to the vice presidency. Um, but it's also her her style, her her method of operation. Um, and I think so much of it is due to her mom, her mother from. Uh, uh, I mean, think about this woman. Uh, who was 19 years old when she came yeah. uh, from India to, you know, halfway around the world to a place she had never been, University of California at Berkeley. Um, and, you know, what a, what a gutsy thing. Her passion was to become a scientist. And, and I think she instilled that drive uh, in, in Kamala Harris and her younger sister, Maya. Um, and they talk, both of them talk about her a, a lot. Kamala Harris at, at every, I mean, you've seen her yeah. uh, when she gives her, her inaugural <laughs> addresses. She always makes reference to her mom. Um, her father um, uh, clearly had a huge influence, but, but as Kamala, um, Kamala Harris has said, um, he's, he's a good guy, but they're just not that close. I'm not clear on why that is. Um, you know, as, as you know, this was an unauthorized biography. She did not um, sit down for questions, nor did her family. Um, so there are gaps in my knowledge. Um, uh, uh, what happened with her dad, it, it, it's not clear to me. I do know that she spent 
uh, time in Jamaica, she and her sister. So she, she knows about her Jamaican roots. They certainly spent time in India, so she knows about her Indian roots. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I find that fascinating. And one of the things you note about her mother, uh, you say that you know, she knew she was raising two black daughters and that that is the way she shaped um, their education, their outlook on life. What, what did she mean by that? And, and how much did that, did that affect what Kamala is today? Mm -hmm. Well, wasn't that insightful of her? Um, she, she knew that in America, um, uh, if you're, one of your parents was black, you, you were gonna be considered black. And, and so she made sure that Kamala Harris understood um, that reality um, and, uh, and, and celebrated it. Um, she, she made sure that uh, she, she, and I'm sure her father made sure that, that, that their daughters um, knew the history of the civil rights movement in the United States, um, uh, made sure that they had role models to uh, look up to. Um, so, so without a doubt, she, um, she understands, um, you know, she, she's a history of the civil rights movement. She understands, uh, what, um, you know, how she got to where she, she is. Um, uh, and, uh, and so much of that, I think is, is due to her mother's, um, uh, perceptiveness. I mean, you talk about too, uh, the social activism, uh, that she learned about the civil rights movement in a stroller. One of the anecdotes uh, that you repeat and she's repeated often was one of her first words being freedom uh, right. as, a, as a toddler. Uh, during the uh, last presidential campaign, though, I know Fox News and some others accused her of plagiarizing that right. uh, anecdote from Martin Luther King. Is there any um, evidence that that is the... Uh, well, you know, it's the story that... It's the story, as she says, her mother told her. Now, her mother died in 2009, so yeah. there's no way, of course, to, to double-check that. Um, you know, I think um, two things can be true. Uh, I think that that yeah. you know maybe maybe Martin Luther King said that, and 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 maybe that's part of the Harris family uh, lore as well. Um, uh, be that as it may, it seemed to me to be, um, you know, just kind yeah. of a, a tempest in, in a campaign filled yeah, with. I would agree with you on that. I would agree with yeah. you on, on the dad. I, I do find it interesting that um, he did surface briefly in her presidential campaign, uh, Donald right. Harris, when she um, kind of made a joke about her Jamaican roots and weed, uh, if you remember. And he right. issued sort of an outrage statement on that, saying that she was, uh, um, you know, denigrating her Jamaican roots. Right. Uh, we, don't, we haven't heard anything else from him, have we? No, no, I think I think he uh, threw that sort of brushback pitch and and we I, haven't we haven't heard her um, uh, talk much about uh, Jamaican weed. Gotcha. No, no, <laughs> Since then. Uh, but we also haven't heard from him. And, and of course, I I reached out to him, uh, sent him a couple of emails, uh, hoping to hear from him. And and he didn't. Uh, but he has given other interviews and he's written widely. So so much of uh, his thoughts are, are out there. Um, you know, it was a misstep, I thought, on Kamala Harris's uh, part uh, to to go there. Um, but, uh, you, you know, she yeah. didn't she didn't make a lot of missteps in the in, in the vice so presidential or presidential campaign. But that but that certainly was one. Yeah. Yeah. I, in fact, when you talk about caution and Kamala Harris, we know both having covered her. That's that's a sort of a, a tall mark of how, who she is. I don't want to talk about that in her campaigns, but on the family issues, her sister Maya um, has been so important, continues to be so important. Just talk a little bit about Maya and, and how uh, this relationship has really sort of forged and, and it's sort of a, a, I don't know, an anchor in her life, is it not? Yeah, well, from everything I gathered from talking to uh, campaign aides and, and others, uh, Maya Harris is, is the f was the first call she made in the morning and the last call she made it at night during the presidential campaign. Um, we know that Maya Harris was 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 very involved. Um, they made the decision to uh, to run for the presidency. Uh, 
Kamala Harris did uh, in a weekend meeting at, at Maya Harris's um, uh, apartment in um, Manhattan. Uh, overlooking Central Park, uh, she's she is uh, integral to to uh, Kamala Harris's uh, life and and world and and um, uh, she um, uh, you know it it is um, uh, it was notable uh, that that Maya Harris's husband Tony West's name was floated as a potential attorney general. Um, uh, it was shot down pretty quickly by the Biden team. So, so while Maya Harris has a big influence, I think on on Kamala Harris, I'm not sure she's going to have a big influence on the Biden administration. Yeah. Um, at least not publicly. Tony West obviously is a great attorney. Um, uh, he uh, was a high number three ranking person in the Obama administration um, Justice Department. Uh, but I, I'm not so sure that that anybody in the Harris circle is necessarily going to be a uh, uh, Biden appointee. When we talk about the Harris circle, uh, one, one other Harris family member has come into the news lately. That's Mina Harris, uh, the niece. Uh, some of the stories suggesting maybe she's riding a little bit too heavy on uh, Aunt Kamala's uh, coattails. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on that? Well, uh, <laughs> You know, it, Mina Harris is, is uh, again, you know, it's, it's a small family. Harris has a small nuclear family. Uh, but but Mina obviously is 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 uh, an integral part to their uh, to the Harris family life. Um, she has been involved in, in Harris's campaigns, uh, working on her, her campaigns. Um, and now she's got this organization, this really marketing uh, organization, it's political and marketing called Phenomenal Women. And, and she um, produces clothing that's got Kamala Harris's um, uh, sayings and other things. I mean, this is integral to, to Mina Harris's brand. Um, but after the Trump administration years were, were you know, clearly the Trump kids uh, capitalized yeah. on, on their father's um, uh, situation, um, I think the Biden people are, are ultra sensitive to it. And, and from what I got, I mean, this story was first reported in, in the LA Times, sort of detailing Mina Harris's um, uh, history. Uh, and then the LA Times reported that the Biden administration uh, uh, basically told her to knock it off. So <laughs> I'm not sure how much, how, how much more we're going to see of Kamala Harris's sayings on, on uh, phenomenal women's sweatshirts. We'll see. Well, so, uh, speaking of uh, some of her sayings that ended up on sweatshirts, uh, one of them was, you know, based in her life in Berkeley and Oakland, uh, the, her, the history of with busing that became sort of the moment in the in the presidential campaign debates um, that, uh, that that sort of shocked the world. And people thought she would never end up on Joe Biden's ticket because of it. Just talk a little bit about that little girl. That moment, and that did end up on on right. T-shirts, and still right. today, people cite that. Yeah, well, sure. In the first debate, um, people, you know, it seems like forever ago, but in the first Democratic debate, um, Harris, you know, Kamala Harris knew that if she was going to win, she'd have to uh, topple Biden. Biden was the front runner. Uh, Biden had the had the close close support in South Carolina. Kamala Harris's path to victory always went through South Carolina. She had to win there and she wasn't winning there. She was the the polling was showing that 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 Biden's um, really had a, a, a bond with with um, voters, Democrats in, in South Carolina. Um, so she threw what she thought might be a knockout punch by basically um, uh, linking him with uh, desegregation or segregationists and, uh, uh, who opposed busing to desegregate. She was uh, a person who was bused uh, uh, when she was a first grader in Berkeley. Um, now, being bused in Berkeley was probably not quite like being bused in Montgomery, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, still it was, you know, it was, a, it was an issue. Um, 
she uh, she talked about that little girl and that and, and that night <laughs> that night after the debate you could per- you could go online and purchase a, a sweatshirt or a t-shirt that had had her the picture of a cute little Kamala Harris with her hair hair and pigtails uh, looking really determined <laughs> really determined it was it's a great look on on her face yeah. um, with with the words that little girl um, and it was selling for you know. 39 bucks, 20 Yeah, bucks, yeah, yeah, no. Bucks. I remember the, yeah. the night of that debate, I don't know if you had the same experience, talking to some of the Biden people, they were so angry at her for, for going there. Right. Some of them said, that's it, she's never going to end up on his ticket, that she just killed it for herself. Right. <laughs> of course, we well, she wasn't. she wasn't running for the second spot. She was running to win. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, who knows what, what happened between Biden and Harris, probably two or three people in the world know that story. Uh, but, you know, Joe Biden understood that, that she was running to win. Um, Joe Biden, you know, not too long thereafter, um, uh, you know, explained his, explained his, his position, um, and, uh, uh, you know, distanced himself from the Joe Biden of, you know, 30, 40 years earlier. Um, uh, so in, in, in a sense, she, she helped make him a little bit better candidate. Um, uh, because obviously the school desegregation yeah. was and remains, uh, uh, an issue for our times. Yeah. Um, so, um, so yeah, they, but you know, what ha- happened in, in uh, over the summer, you know, with the terrible death of George Floyd, um, uh, it changed, it changed politics in America. It really did certainly democratic politics. Yeah. Um, and, and so it became kind of an imperative that, 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 that if Biden was going to win, he was going to, he was going to find a person of color to be his running mate. And he had already said he wanted a woman. Um, so that narrowed it down. And, and, uh, and so then yeah. it came down to just a handful of, of potential candidates. She and was she the had, only one. Yeah, was, she had uh, the uh, sort of the advantage too of, I mean, coming out of the historically black colleges, the, the Alpha Kappa Alpha, uh, you know, the sorority that was the just massive organization behind her. She had so many women behind her. Um, I, I just think that when you when you look at that history, uh, that was part of the situation. At the same time, uh, based on her career here in California, she took I had I, maybe this is your sense, too. Some of the most the nastiest racial and, and misogynist hits of any candidate I've ever seen online. Oh, yeah. Um, in part based on her, that they, a lot of people went back to that relationship with Willie Brown, which you write about in the in the book. Um, you know, just talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, it, it was it was a a mutually beneficial relationship, uh, but she took a lot of hits for that one. Yeah, well, um, uh, you're talking about the relationship between her and and then Speaker uh, yeah. Willie Brown. Um, so that ended in 1995. Um, uh, it it played out in the in the columns of Herb Kane. Uh, so that's how we knew about it. She uh, Herb Kane uh, 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 in his uh, uh, in his way uh, made it a very public uh, uh, relationship. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, and then, and so it started in Herb Cain and, and it ended in Herb Cain after, uh, uh, in December of 1995, uh, clearly that helped. Um, Willie Brown was, was, is a, 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 pol- a huge political force certainly was in 1995, um, he helped her without a doubt, without a doubt. Uh, people helped Willie Brown too. I mean, nobody gets to where they get in politics with, with, without, um, without somebody behind you. Phil Burton was, was uh, Willie Brown would not have been won his assembly race back in 1964 without Phil Burton. Um, uh, it, certainly John Burton, Phil Burton's uh, younger brother, uh, uh, incredible politician uh, and policymaker himself, uh, certainly helped Willie Brown along the way and Willie helped them. So, pe- you know, people get helped. Yeah. Um, yeah. So without a doubt, he was he was beneficial. She yeah. later viewed him as quite the albatross and and in no uncertain terms, uh, uh, really, you know, uh, 
tried to tried to distance herself from him, but it doesn't. It goes on. I mean, you still say, I get it all the time. I we do I absolutely these, um. <laughs> these wildly racist and sexist emails of, about her. I mean, this is a woman who's accomplished a great deal. This yeah, is, and, and, you yeah. know, as you mentioned in the book, you know, she was a, she was a a, a, a well thought of a prosecutor in Alameda County at the time uh, she was going with him. Uh, do you think, I mean, can we say that from watching Willie is where she got the taste for politics? That's where she kind of connected with it. Um, because from then on, she was she was definitely a political animal, it seems like. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it goes back before that. Um, when she was at Howard, we know that she yes, right. uh, was was engaged in 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 political activity. She was uh, marching against apartheid while at Howard. Um uh, it, one of the interesting um, uh, stories, um, I think it was told by uh, Politico's David Siders uh, first um, uh, on election night, uh, 1992. Um, uh, as you as you recall, I mean, I think we were probably both there that night at the right. Fairmont. Right. Um, it was a big night for Democrats. Dianne Feinstein won. Barbara Boxer won. Uh, U.S. Senate seats. Yep. Um, Bill There's Clinton won. Right. So, so that night, uh, she got in her, um, you know, little Toyota Corolla and drove across the bridge um, from Oakland to um, uh, to be at that victory party. Um, so, who who could have imagined, really, in 1992, November 1992, that that you know that face in the crowd would become vice president? But he, clearly, she was thinking about politics before she met Willie Brown. Yeah. Um, yeah. When she met him, you know, he, he she, I mean, she was with him throughout his, his campaign for mayor. So she saw how politics worked. Yeah. Yeah. And then and, and went on to the San Francisco DA's office um, where you remind us in the book. Also working there at the time was a 26 year old lawyer named Kimberly Guilfoyle, <laughs> who ended yeah. up, of course, being uh, first lady of San Francisco, the wife, the first wife of Gavin Newsom. And then. Uh, more recently, the girlfriend of Donald Trump Jr. and a major force in the Trump campaign. Uh, did they know each other? Did they hit it off? Or what do we what do we know about that relationship? <laughs> yeah, well, so you know, so that's that's again one of those relationships. I, I I'd love to know the real story, um, <laughs> but uh, but you know what the public story is is no, they did not hit it off, <laughs> not nearly uh, well at all. No, they they. Um, uh, there was uh, no small amount of friction. Uh, Kimberly Gufoyle uh, uh, alleged that, that Kamala Harris uh, tried to block her return from the district attor- to the district attorney's office in San Francisco. Um, uh, she had been there as a, as a as a rookie lawyer and then was uh, fired by Terry Hall- Terrence Hallinan. Uh, and then she tried to get back into uh, the office and and uh, according to Gufoyle. Harris tried to block that. Yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah. So there was this back and forth. Um, <laughs> it wasn't uh, blood there from the beginning? Yeah, no, no, no love lost. But you know, there are these other connections between between Harris. Um, you know, sort of foreshadowing what what would happen. I mean, I know that in 1994 she flew on 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 Trump's airplane. That uh, is that fascinating. Just explain on that. How would she? How did she and Willie Brown end up on Donald Trump's plane? Yeah, well, um, so she was part of an entourage that went back east um, uh, in 1994, and um, uh, the the uh, and and Trump at the time, uh, you know, was a big developer, I guess, um, and had had in mind that he wanted to turn the Ambassador Hotel in in Los Angeles, the place where Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated, uh, into a Trump property. Um, and he needed state approval to, to do this. And, and uh, uh, so he contacted Willie Brown while Brown was on this trip <laughs> and, and uh, invited him down to New York to have lunch. And, and they all got on the plane. Uh, Harris was not part of the lunch, but the entourage got onto the plane down to New York. And uh, uh, then Speaker Brown had lunch with Trump and uh, uh, tried to sort it out. Trump obviously never uh, took control of the ambassador. Uh, but this was his this was his plan. Yeah, that, 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 that's a great little detail there about that ride. But and that's where uh, her political career begins, though, is in the San Francisco DA's office, mm-hmm. where we both remember covering her race against Terrence Hallinan, who at the time, 
you know, this big Irish guy, K.O. Hallinan, uh, lion of the left, uh, to think that, that she could take him on was a little bit of a stretch for a lot of people at the time. Well, you bet you covered that. I was, you know, I was uh, happily covering the recall uh, in 2003 of <laughs> Ray Davis. Another recall. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, yeah, no, this was a, this was a bold move. I mean, you know, people do, and I, you know, I wrote this multiple times when I was, uh, when I was a columnist and editorial writer at the SACP that, that she was cautious, but you know what, it was a bold move to take on Terrence Helen. And it was not, you know, she started at 6% in the polls and, and nobody knew who she was. And, and, uh, she had no money. Obviously she comes from a, a family that was uh, intellectually elite, but certainly not wealthy. Yeah. And um, so she had to raise money at $500 a crack uh, from, from, uh, uh, you know, from everybody in, 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 in San Francisco. She had this great fundraising chairman, Mark Buell, yeah. uh, who, who, uh, who helped make that happen. Um, you know, it was, uh, and, and you look at who her f- first donors were. I mean, it was, you know, there were a lot of a, a, a lot of people who were who were the elite of San Francisco came to her aid. That's in no small part because of Mark Buell and the the organization organization that he helped put together on her behalf. Yeah. Um, so yeah. But her but her career in San Francisco uh, as a DA had its bumps uh, from the start, uh, including sort of knocking heads with Diane Feinstein over issues like the death penalty, uh, the the death of the. Police officer Isaac Espinoza. That that incident continues to continue to haunt her through her presidential campaign. Correct, Dan? Sure, sure. Yeah, you know, it, she ran on a platform as uh, running for district attorney of opposing the death penalty. She was never. It's never been a secret. She is a moral opponent of capital punishment. Um, uh, and that got tested in 2004. She's sworn in in 2000, January 2004, April 2004. Um, uh, Officer Espinosa's gunned down in, in the Bayview district uh, uh, for no reason, no good, I mean, no reason at all. Terrible sh- murder. Yeah. And, and three days later, she announced before uh, Officer Espinosa's funeral that he. Um, that she would not be seeking the death penalty that outraged uh, uh, police in San Francisco and, and it outraged <laughs> Senator Feinstein who made that clear at Espinosa's funeral. There was Kamala Harris sitting in, you know, at the front of the, of, uh, of the cathedral uh, with a thousand uh, officers from all around the state in the audience and Feinstein, said this was a capital case and ought to be prosecuted as such. Officers yeah. stood and applauded. Yeah. Uh, Harris did not. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it was quite, you know, it was quite dramatic. Um, uh, she stuck to it, though. Um, you know, after after the funeral, she wrote a, uh, an op-ed in your then paper, The Chronicle, uh, making clear that her decision was final. It was final, and she wasn't going to bend, and she never did as district attorney. Yeah, and and this is as district attorney too. I think one other sort of critical moment was a, a, her her philosophy on criminal justice reform. That's where we started to see that the smart on crime um, mm-hmm. philosophy, uh, even going after truancy, something that some progressives uh, are still uh, mad at her about in some respects. Uh, but that's where we kind of saw her shaping her her philosophy. Correct. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, it wasn't just truancy. I mean, she went out to the to the housing projects, Sunnyvale. Uh, uh, un, it, nobody covered it. It was it was uh, uh, she went out there on her own uh, with well, she went out there with with you know, with a you know, a few prosecutors and a right. cop. Um, to try to, you know, talk to people, to try to talk to young men who were uh, who were at risk for heading down uh, a bad path. Um, so, yes, she she was trying to do things as district attorney. Now, of course, the the I mean, without a doubt, the left thinks that she could have done a lot more. Maybe she could have. Um, she, there were certainly issues when she was California attorney general, 
that I covered that uh, uh, where she could have gone further, she could have em- embraced the either of the death penalty uh, initiatives, ballot measures to abolish capital punishment. She could have opposed the one to uh, uh, that sought to speed up capital punishment. She didn't. She didn't take positions on those. Um, yeah, so was- there were issues that she could have that she could have uh, engaged in that she that she didn't to the to the dismay of progressives, without a doubt. That's where, you know, as you mentioned, um, as AG of California, she kind of got uh, this this uh, um, image of being too cautious, cautious Kamala, somebody who uh, tried to to uh, thread the needle on some very co- controversial things. Uh, you know, I was I was one of the ones and you maybe you were, too, when she ran against Steve Cooley, the Republican in that race. And let's remember, she she never lost a race until the presidential race. She she was successful every time. Right. I, I wasn't sure she was going to win that one. That was uh, he was a moderate Republican. Correct. I mean, she was up against a a, uh, a very big sort of uh, challenge there going up against a moderate Republican from Los Angeles and somebody who uh, a lot of people thought had more experience than she did. Um, but but Kamala uh, at the time you wrote uh, that uh, Steve Cooley, the, the Republicans political strategist, said, that this was all about her political ambition. This was about Kamala Harris being vice president. Did you was the ambition there that you know even that early in her AG race? Do you think? Oh well, I do think that she she didn't think the AG the the uh, her time as attorney general would would be her last stop. <laughs> um, but you know it is it is true that 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 you know Steve Cooley told me in, in the reporting of this book that that his political consultant said, you know, Steve, this is not about the race for attorney general. It's about the vice presidency. Um, the, and uh, uh, now Cooley dismissed his uh, consultant. He didn't think that she had the chops for that. But, right. you know, it's, it's one of the it's one of the I think one of the great examples of, of people underestimating this woman. Um, yeah. now you can agree with her politically or not, but she's a very good politician. Yeah. And, and um, uh, and and you know Republicans who have underestimated her uh, or Democrats do it do it at their peril. Now it is the case though that that national Republicans didn't dismiss her. And and um, you know I wrote, I'm sure you wrote uh, about uh, uh, about the more than million dollars that that the Republican super PAC spent to. Uh, 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 derail her uh, campaign in 2010 against Cooley. They really wanted Cooley to win. Um, uh, and the reason I was told back at the time was, was that they, the Republicans thought that, that they needed to, to stop her then. Yeah, right. They didn't stop her uh, becoming attorney general. Uh, you know, AG stands for aspiring governor. So she yes. could become <laughs> governor, or she could become senator, or she could become vice president. So they knew that she was someone to contend with, whether That's Cooley did or not. After her right then. I, she also, uh, as AG, made friends in, uh, in, in high places. Uh, we, were, we were both in Iowa in 2008. She was AG then, right? Um, yes. when well, no, she was, she was, uh, she was still, DA. She was yeah. still DA then. But... Mm-hmm. Uh, knew Barack Obama was there in the snows. I remember following her around the snows of Iowa. You did too, uh, stumping for him at uh, you know shopping centers and other places. She she went to bat for him early on. I think before anyone else, any other sort of major political figure did. Am I right? She was one of the very yeah early- yeah, yeah. Well, in the in the course of re- doing this this book, I remember reading one of the stories where. That uh, one Carla Marinucci wrote about uh, uh, about her talking about Obama's big uh, uh, rally in in Oakland and how excited she was and 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 how um, uh, enthralled the the crowd was and energetic. Um, y- you know, it is the case that in in two thousand seven. Uh, in early 2008, California was Hillary Clinton territory. This was not an Obama state. It was right. never going to be an Obama state in uh, at that time. And um, uh, but she she saw in him the the potential and and was one of the. I, I think she was the first elected official to uh, come out to support him. 
uh, it was one of his his main surrogates, which is really uh, the first time when when I uh, got a chance to talk with her. Um, uh, because I was part of the LA times team that covered the presidential race in seven and eight. Um, so yeah, she was, um, she was very much involved, but then it dated before that she was, um, uh, she helped organize a fundraiser for him in 2004 when she was a first year, attorney, uh, district attorney and, and he was, a you know, state Senator from, yeah, no, no, she was, she was in early, and, you know, as district attorney, there were, there were a couple of, um, sort of uh, uh, scripts about her. Uh, I want to hear your thoughts on one was, was that she was too cautious, wouldn't take positions on big issues. The other one that was, it was that she was very tough on her staff. That we saw yeah. a parade of people going in and out of that office. Okay, yeah. so you want to deal with the second one first? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, <laughs> without a doubt. Was she, or was she? Yeah, so, so more than one staffer has told me, former staffer or, yeah, former staffer, I guess, it, would be the most accurate. Um, uh, when you see her, when you saw her um, uh, grilling uh, uh, U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions or U.S. Attorney General <laughs> Bill Barr or or uh, Trump uh, uh, Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh, when you saw her grilling them, she wasn't yelling. She was she was doing what prosecutors do. She was pointed in her questions and. And more than one staffer said, you know, that struck home. <laughs> these were, these are, uh, you know, she could be very uh, pointed in her questions of, of staff and she expected them to be, she expects them to be really well prepared. Um, she notices typos um, uh, in, in briefing papers. Um, so she's, yeah, she is, um, she, she can be, uh, tough to work for. She's also incredibly charming and and um, and and thoughtful. Um, yeah. You know, more than one uh, staffer, a former staffer, uh, tells me about you know phone calls she makes. Uh, uh, you know, commemorate horrible tragedies in their lives, the death of a child, for example. Yeah, there's a couple of anecdotes in the book, I think, um, that were very surprising to read, very interesting to read about how she did these little sort of works, quiet works of charity for people or out of love uh, that were out of the headlines. Uh, for instance, L uh, Lily Smith, um, who's the daughter of A. Smith, the consultant, um, she developed a, a very close relationship with this little girl um, who has since died. I mean, just talk a little bit about that and, and, and some of the ways that, um, you know, she made connections with people outside of the headlines that really people didn't hear about. Mm -hmm. Well, this was um, really right when I first started working on this book. Um, uh, I talked to Ace and, and really uh, his wife, Lily's mom, um, uh, Laura Th Thomas. Um, and, and Laura told me this story about, um, you know, Lily died when she was 15, tragically of a seizure. And... Um, and, uh, you know, Harris dropped what she was doing that weekend or, you know, when she learned of the death and, and, and came sets Shiva with, with uh, A. Smith and Laura Thomas. And then, and then in years since then, well, first of all, she's, she's helped uh, raise whenever asked, helped raise money for, for the foundation that they created Beyond Differences. Beyond Differences, right. Which is some pretty amazing work. Uh, but then she she also makes phone calls to um, uh, to you know, Laura on on dates that are um, you know anniversary dates of a death are always really tough so you know Mother's Day birthdays that sort of thing um, just to let let her know that somebody out there knows remembers is thinking of her I mean I was moved by that I don't know who who wouldn't be. Yeah, no, I mean, I think those were those are very uh, important issues uh, with regard to her career. On on the issue of her, you know, sidestepping, I just want to remind the audience, by the way, uh, and we're going to take your questions in about fifteen minutes, so you can get them in there to us in the chat. Uh, on her sidestepping key issues, uh, marijuana legalization, for instance, um, other other key issues, is that out of caution? Was or has she? She always said, well, as the AG, I had to, you know, decide I had to, uh, um, you know, I litigate these cases. Uh, that's why I didn't take positions on them. Um, was she was that, was that political expedience or was that 
you know, conviction? Shall I say yes? <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I think she she didn't take positions on the death penalty initiatives because um, uh, death penalty because deputies attorney general uh, were arguing cases before this California Supreme Court and and federal courts. Um, so so she 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 could take that stand. She also when she ran for attorney general, she said, I oppose the death penalty, but will enforce the law. Right. So I so she could also say that she was um, sticking true to um, uh, to her um, yeah. uh, to her campaign promise. Um, uh yeah, you know, I mean, she didn't take a stand on 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 marijuana legalization early. She ultimately did take a stand on marijuana legalization. Yeah. You, you know, she she picks and chooses her fights. Um, there were instances where she could have taken a stand. She could have taken a stand, been more aggressive on on um, uh, police misconduct. Legislation was pending. She could have taken a stand on on certain privacy bills that that uh, that went through the legislature when she was AG. She did it. Um, she did take stands on other things like, you know, um, uh, gun control. She, she I think she was consistently uh, uh, supportive of of uh, of strict laws uh, to keep guns out of the hands of people who really shouldn't have guns. Right. Um, so that was that was a through line. Um, she was certainly um uh, bold uh, and and tested the 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 bounds of of, of state law uh, on the issue of human trafficking. Um, yes, actually, and she was and, she was very and, big on that. You know, and that was a big deal. I mean, what she did in the case of Backpage, Backpage um, was a online classified ad section. She called it an online bordello. Uh, filed uh, criminal cases against criminal case against. The, the executives of Backpage alleging uh, pimping. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the the her case got uh, case. I mean, she knew without a doubt this was pressing the the bounds of state law, and a judge threw it out the first time. She uh, under her direction, the the deputy attorney general Maggie Krill. Uh, failed, uh, refiled the case as a money laundering case, and that case is still pending. But at any rate, the whole Backpage issue the, the the her concern was not so much adults uh, but that it was trafficking minors that minors were being advertised in the pages of of back page um, and uh, uh, what she the stand she took there uh, ultimately led to a federal prosecution uh, ultimately led I I think you can argue uh, to federal legislation that that carved out an exception to the federal law, the Communications Decency Act. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so that states can bring these sorts of cases now. So, yeah, no, no, she um, did. Yeah. yeah. Started that was, here. That was, that was import, uh, important stuff. You're absolutely right. She, she sort of laid, laid down a marker there. When, on her, um, uh, I, I want to get to some of the, the, more, the more recent history. On her run for U.S. Senate, we all remember when Barbara Boxer uh, announced she would not run again for U.S. Senate. And uh, the word was at the time, did you hear this as well, that, that Kamala really wanted to be governor of California? Uh, as we all, we all remember how Gavin Newsom threw down, like almost immediately and said, I'm running for governor, mm -hmm. uh, which left the Senate seat open. Is that, uh, is that how you, you know, heard too? Uh, and it did yeah, she well, want to be governor? Well, yeah, I think I think she did want to become governor. I think, though, that when Barbara Boxer announced that she was not running, um, she um, she gathered in uh, in the office of of uh, uh, A. Smith and Sean Clegg and Dan Newman um, uh, in San Francisco, and and they they talked it through, and um, and they came to the you know she came to the conclusion that 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 the Senate was was a wiser path and it was kind of interesting to me. Um, one of the arguments, as as I understand it, was was um, you know the news be for a whole variety of reasons that that you and I have lived the local news, state house news has has been diminished less so in Sacramento than in other states. 
um, you know, there's still a very aggressive press corps in, in, in Sacramento, and, and, and obviously there's great coverage uh, uh, in, in the city of San Francisco. Um, but, um, but the argument was that news has become nationalized, increasingly so, and that, that, that the path to higher office goes through Washington, not through state houses. Um, you know, you think about Steve Bullock running for U.S. Uh, for the presidency in 2019. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, who remembers Steve Bullock's run? You know, he could have been a, a, a contender uh, in an earlier time. Yeah. Nobody yeah. knows who he is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the argument was that, that you know, think, think of Elizabeth Warren and think of Deval Patrick. Deval Patrick's a very talented yeah. Uh, yeah. politician, thoughtful policy person. Nobody knows who he is outside the, the the Northeast, and everybody knows who Elizabeth Warren is. So, so the path to Iowa and New Hampshire really did go through through Washington, and I think that that resonated with her. Yeah, no, um, I know we were both there in Oakland um, the day that she announced her presidential campaign. Uh, Twenty five thousand people were there. That was quite a a, a visual. It was quite a moment. Um, what do you what do you think happened in that campaign? Because it was we said that was that's the only campaign she's ever lost. Mm -hmm. Well, um, actually, I wasn't in Oakland. I was over in San Francisco that okay. day, hanging out with a with with, with a couple of grandbabies. But uh, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but we were watching it. Yeah. We were watching it. It was you know, they all sh everybody showed up to this thing. It was it, right. it was real happening. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was, it was, um, uh, you know, we were watching it, and and it was a made-for-television moment. I mean, it was incredible. Um, you know, the number of flags they imported to Oakland. <laughs> we've been, <laughs> it was, we've it never was seen anything like this. And you know, it was a, it was a scene. It was beautifully yeah. crafted, yeah. and it suggested that her campaign, you know, this was going somewhere. This was going to be something. Right, and um, uh, and that was the high point. Uh, and it was kind of downhill from there. Um, you know, it hurt, hurt. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't on the campaign trail. And, and so, so I know that there are things that I don't know, but, um, the, the, you know, her fundraising, uh, key to this key to any presidential campaign is fundraising her first quarter in 2019, she raised 12 million bucks. Well, that's, you know, it's obviously a lot of money in my world and yours. Um, but uh, but Barack Obama in his first quarter in 2007 raised 27 million. So so yeah. so, you know, even though she had come from Cal she was coming from California, she had raised money in the Silicon Valley and downtown San Francisco and Hollywood and Beverly Hills. Twelve million bucks. Just, I mean, that was that was mediocre. Um, she didn't carve out a lane. Um, in, in any kind of serious way. Um, she waffled on single payer. Um, you know, she never could topple Joe Biden for, for that sort of center left position. Yeah. Um, you know, Pete Buttigieg was, was the fundraising phenom, phenom uh, in that campaign. But Elizabeth. And then, Warren, and then there were issues about money. About the bi coastal nature of the campaign. You had A. Yeah. Smith out here. And and uh, Maya back in in uh, on, on the East Coast, correct? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Juan Rodriguez was was trying to keep it all together as the campaign manager. It just, um, you know, I going in, going in from what I gather, uh, she understood that she had maybe a ten percent chance of getting the nomination. Um, ten percent. That you know, it's it's hard to become a party nominee, you know, not very many people do it. It's really hard to become president. We've only had 46 of them. So, um, so she understood that the odds were long heading in, um, you know, if things had broken differently in certain ways, maybe she could have done uh, a, a little bit better, but I think Democrats really decided, really decided that Joe Biden was the one. Yeah, um, he, he was front runner from beginning to end. And um, we have, you know, a, we have a couple runner. of questions coming in, Dan. And, uh, you know, I think one of them I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, you know, as a campaigner, as a candidate, what what do you think is her greatest strength and mm -hmm. what is potentially her biggest weakness? Uh, uh, someone wants to know um, as, as she goes for her strength. I, I would say, I mean, from my, com her communication style, her charisma on the campaign trail. Yeah. Is, yeah. Is there. Well, you know, I mean, I've seen her 
give speeches and, you know, sort of closed room, she lights up the room. Yeah. Uh, you know, people, you know, she's, she's got an infectious smile. She, you know, she laughs readily. Um, uh, she, you know, she, she is, uh, she's, she's a charismatic person. Her, her, um, weakness has been that, that she, uh, she doesn't take stands on issues that were, were she, in which she really ought to. I mean, I remember, uh, a, a story you wrote, um, when she was running for the U S Senate, you know, her opening and she didn't allow press in. I mean, how weird was that? Yeah, um, it's very difficult to. Which yeah, is yeah. I mean, one thing, one thing you know and I know is that, and and the Washington press corps will know, is that she's really good at not answering a question. <laughs> um, you know, she can answer a question. She can be inc incredibly charming. She, if if she if she uh, feels prepared, she will she will answer a question in 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 a very thoughtful way, and she will not answer a question. And you can ask it 10 different ways and she will not answer. She's, very She's good. really good at that. Yeah. yeah. Hey, what, what strengths does she bring to Joe Biden? Um, we, we have uh, 15 minutes left and not, uh, people are asking some questions, to, particularly to Biden. She, she was asked this week, by the way, you know, what is her what is her goal? What is going to be her signature issue? And her answer was making Joe Biden a, su a success. Um, what does she bring yeah. to the to the to the White House? Well, you know, I mean, that that it seems to me that that, um, you know, I think we have little doubt, but that but that at some point she's going to run for president. I don't know if it's four years. People, the conventional wisdom back east is that is that Biden will be a one term president. He's wanted to be president for a long, long time. Yeah. I think if his health it permits. I don't see why he wouldn't run. But at any rate, if it's uh, four years or eight years or 12 years, whatever it is, she's going to run again. Um, in order to be successful, she has to have a really successful Biden presidency. So that means she has to be as uh, the, the best vice president she can possibly be. She has to, um, uh, you know, if she disagrees with him, that's going to happen behind closed doors. Um, what she brings is, uh, I mean, look at her. Look at, yeah. look at uh, you know, she's out there a lot. She is. Um, you know, she's being interviewed on CNN. She's she's um, uh, making lots of public appearances. I mean, you know, you, you yeah, don't, she brings, the, you, she brings you that sort of youth energy, charisma yeah. angle to yeah, uh, she jogs up the steps at the Washington Monument, I guess it was. Right. I mean, she's yeah, she's she's got a lot of she's got a lot of energy. Um, and, you know, it's. Um, you don't you don't pick Kamala Harris to be your vice president because you want a potted plant. You want you pick her, you pick her because she's because she's uh, she brings something and 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 you encourage that. I think and and, and not the least of which um, what she means to women in this role. Uh, and, the, the you well, know the swearing probably. in. I heard from women all over all over the country on Twitter and elsewhere uh, about how moved they were watching her take that oath. This was a m moment women on both sides of the aisle had waited for for so long, but particularly black women mm -hmm. uh, who had taken such a role in this campaign. Uh, so that the, the perspective, you know, what you write about in the in the book, this whole history of growing up as a child of immigrants, uh, uh, you know, Berkeley, Oakland, that perspective is a, is a perspective we haven't seen in the White House before. Yeah. Um, and that, I mean, Obama obviously brought his own uh, pers immigrant perspective also, but this is just a, a woman's an, a woman's perspective, and that is invaluable, isn't it, uh, to Joe Biden? Well, you, you know, I think it is. I think it's uh, yes. Every little girl can can see <laughs> in a way yeah. that you know people like me have always seen that you know they they can if you know if they have the the right stuff and 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 um, the right timing that 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 they can do anything right um it's always you know i mean yeah so so it's so yeah it it, it matters a lot you know i, I spoke uh, the the one of the best um uh, half hours I've spent in the last couple months was uh, talking to uh, uh, Ms. Luna's fifth grade class uh, in <laughs> Sacramento. And, and there was one little girl there who was just amazing from Afghanistan. 
uh, you know, really bright. And yeah, this, this resonates with five, you know, fifth graders. Yeah. Um, yeah no. I think that that's really important. It's super yeah. important. I mean, absolutely. I think that that's a, that's a moment uh, for America that you just can't, but, but that sort of symbolic importance also puts her right in the target um, for Republicans. We heard Lindsey Graham say this week yeah. um, that should Kevin McCarthy become speaker uh, in the next cycle, that the first thing they're going to do likely is impeach Kamala Harris. Can you talk a little bit about that? Are the Republicans going to be able to um, in, in go after her to that level already yeah. this, this quickly? What's your thoughts? Well, you know, what, what, when, I, when I saw that, uh, yeah. that line from, from Senator Graham, I, th I thought about the, the uh, 2010 million, do million dollar plus expenditure to knock her off before she became attorney general. Yeah, of course, if, if, the, if the Republicans regain the House in, in 2022, 20, uh, um, they're going to do everything they can to, to target Kamala Harris, Vice President Harris, because they know she's going to run for president and they don't want to, uh, another Democrat in the White House. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, that, that, that's what they would do. Um, I, you know, I think that, that part of that calculation is playing in the, the, you know, the attempt to uh, recall Governor Newsom here. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. Let's talk about that a little bit because uh, I think we have to wonder, I, I, we have to wonder how is Gavin Newsom looking at her on the cover of every magazine, you know, being lionized while he's in the midst of this recall um, mm -hmm. mess, but is she, you know, what's the relationship like, do you think? Um, it hasn't always been incredibly comfortable, but they talk about each other as friends and certainly I, you know, I covered them campaigning together uh, um, in, in like the last cycle. Uh, what, you know, is she going to help him out? He's, he's under the gun here with this recall. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I think, you know, I think it was one of Trump's true failings that, that he uh, was so dismissive and, and, um, uh, and really derisive of California. Um, you know, California is really important to, to the state of the nation. Um, and, and I think that without a doubt, Kamala Harris is, is going to be there for Gavin Newsom. I mean, she has to be, um, uh, uh, you know, the personal relationship. Yeah, of course, it started out. They were rivals and it was frosty in 2003. And uh, when he was mayor and she was attorney, uh, district attorney, they, they there were clashes, um, uh, no doubt. But. Uh, but they need one another now. Um, you know, it, it's it's on issues like water. You know, I mean, California has an opportunity here to really fix the water system in California. Um, but you know, that's obviously not going to happen if 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 Governor Newsom is is re is recalled this year. Um, so so yeah, they're going to do whatever they can do to to help him without a doubt. Yeah, I mean. And how much help do you think? I mean, when you talk about the pandemic issues like that, um, also on criminal justice reform, also on issues like climate change, having that white, that vice president um, who knows California, who wants to reach out, this is a whole different scenario. Well, immigration is going to be a huge immigration. issue. Right. But but it's really COVID, COVID, COVID. I mean, they've got to get, you know, we've got to get vaccinations uh, out, you know, doses out here um, uh, and and some so much of and so much of the nation's economy depends on California's success. So so if if, um, uh, you know, if California's economy can get clicking again, yeah, um, it's it's going to it's going to help Biden and, and Harris. And, and I just want to talk quickly. We have a couple of minutes left. If anybody has any other questions, let's uh, throw them into the chat. On her family today, um, we're looking at a family that is very different from anyone we've seen in the White House. Her husband, Doug Emhoff, is a uh, white Jewish lawyer from Los Angeles. Um, I, I have to say from covering him on the campaign trail, it's been kind of a joy to do that. He is, he is very much um, behind her all the way. Uh, he's had some like crazy incidents where he's literally carried people out of her crowds when they fainted by, by himself or throw, as you write in the book, thrown himself in front of uh, people on stage who have tried to get to her. Um, 
Uh, there's a story today about how their relationship could be kind of a landmark one. That is a black woman with a white man, uh, you know, in a high profile relationship like this is something America hasn't seen too often at the political level. How much is that relationship and her role as, you know, Mamala to uh, his two kids, one of whom has become like a, a star on Instagram. Right. <laughs> right, right. Well, isn't it isn't it interesting? I mean, talk about talking talk about a a, a modern American family, right? Um, yeah, I think it's extraordinary, and I think Doug Emhoff, who you know I've only met him a couple of times, um, is just a delightful guy. You know, really charming. Seems to love being Kamala Harris's husband. Um, uh, you know, he was really wise to quit his uh, partnership at DLA Park Piper. Um, you know, that cost the Harris family, I'm sure, a ton of money, but it would have cost it. Would, I mean, what a headache that would have been. Yeah. Uh, they've got a big lobby operation in D.C., so he's, he's going to teach. I think any student um, uh, who takes his class is, is going to be well served. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's obviously a very accomplished lawyer. And, I, you know, I think it's so um, interesting how he has um, really taken to this. I mean, he he. Like I say, I think he loves being the se the second gentleman, uh, yeah. and, and and I I think he's going to um, serve uh, her and us uh, well. So, from what we know about her history, uh, politically and personally, what do you think are the potential biggest pitfalls ahead for her? Uh, as she, you know, obviously ha has ambition for for higher office. She's uh, there's a lot of competition out there, as we saw in the last presidential race. What could be the the places where uh, you know she might need to overcome? Well, you know, I think I think it was uh, wise of the Biden administration to um, urge that Mina Harris. Of course, they can't control what Mina Harris does uh, to back off from using uh, Aunt Kamala's um, uh, name. Uh, for her brand. Um, so I think that that's important, but really it's, 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 it's COVID. It comes down to, to solving this. If, if this time uh, next year uh, COVID is in a rear view mirror, well, you know, that's gonna, that's gonna help. Um, she has to be the best vice president. If there are disagreements you and I folks like you and I should never know about that. Right. I mean, it has to be between two people <laughs> yeah. uh, and, 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 and not the world. So if, you know, so if stories start leaking out about disagreements or if stories start leaking out about how she's planning a run in 2024, I mean, that will be devastating. And, yeah. and uh, so anyway, she can't let that happen. Well, we've reached a time where we have one time for one more question. Uh, one of our listeners wants to know, Dan, what made you want to pick Kamala Harris originally as the subject of the, of the book? How, how did you, you know, how'd you make that choice? Well, it came to me. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, this was, this was, uh, this was a, a project that stemmed from a, a, a piece that I did for the Washington Post, a kind editor there, Michael Duffy, uh, suggested that I should write a, a biography. This was in August. Um, of last year suggested I write a biography of Kamala Harris. And I thanked him. I was flattered and, you know, waffled. And a couple of weeks later, he sent me another email urging that I do it. And he had a friend at Simon and Schuster who was, uh, who he would call and, uh, you know, I talked it over with my wife and, and I said, sure, let's, let's see where it, it leads. So that was basically at the beginning of September. Um, but as you know, I mean, Carla, you and I have been doing this for a lot of years. So, so although it was a real crunch, for those two months uh, until my deadline, which was November, crunching, November crunching. 3rd, um, <laughs> my deadline was November 3rd was to, but we, you know, we've been writing about her and California government and policy and politics for a career. And so it was kind of bringing together a lot of things that, that I had written about, you had written about people at the Chronicle and Politico had written about and, and, and crunching it all into you know, 230 pages. Well, I put it, it put it all in, in one place, I think, for, for anyone who wants to familiarize themselves with uh, with Kamala Harris and her life. Uh, and, and, you know, as you as you know, the story's not over yet. We're going to be reading about her. And I mean, 
and we don't and right. we don't know where the presidential campaign will be or what what is the timeline but you're pretty sure it's going to happen correct oh yeah <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, of course, you, you know, you can never exactly predict what's going to happen, but this is, this is her, um, you know, this, this is her path. Um, uh, and it, and it's so extraordinary. I mean, it's, it's called an American life, but really it's a California life. I'm not sure she could have happened in any other state than California, maybe not, no other place than um, the San Francisco Bay area. I, th I think you're right, Dan. Um, so it was, it was such a pleasure to talk to you. And, and uh, the book is such a great book. Um, and Kamala's Way in America Life, published by Simon & Schuster. Uh, we encourage you to pick up your copy of Dan's book at your local bookstore or online. I, and a reminder, if you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club effort, please visit www.commonwealthclub.org. I'm Carla Marinucci. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.